are taking a walk. God, it's an airplane. Come on. Here we go. Come on, come on, come on, come on, come on. Run, 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 run. Run, 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 run. Run, 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 run. Run. Arlie is so into picking dandelions now. She wants a little dandelion. Thank you. Okay. I had to get her out of the house, guys. She needed to get some energy out. She's just, she was feeling cooped up this morning, I think, and was ready to go. She was very active. Hey, Arlie. What are you having for lunch? She's having some gluten-free bread with a little bit of dairy-free butter, a hamburger patty, and some sweet potato fries. And then she has her water inside of her sippy cup. So that's her lunch for today. Hey guys, and welcome back to my channel. If you haven't already subscribed, now will be a great time to do that. In today's video, I just wanted to talk to you about why I am feeding my youngest daughter a gluten and dairy free diet. So this all started around October of 2019. A couple things happened during that time period. The first thing that happened was I started a new job. I became a preschool teacher and I think I've mentioned this before. I'm not really going to want to go into it too much again, but the preschool that I was working for is run through the actual school system. However, it was being hosted at a daycare center which worked out great for me because I could bring Arlington to school or daycare with me. So prior to that, Arlington was with me 24 seven. I was like her sole caregiver. Um, on and off, I would sub a little bit for the school system, but it was generally my mom who would happened to be down and she would watch Arlie. So Arlie was never really in the care of any other providers or with a lot of other children. Now, I've worked in daycare before and I know that a lot of times when young children especially start daycare, they're gonna get sick because their immune system hasn't quite been built up yet to get defensive against all of those germs that they're meeting in the classroom. And especially a child who is 14 months old who does not know how to cover their mouth from sneezes and coughs and they're teething so every little thing is constantly going into their mouth. And no matter how much the teachers can try to run around and take toys from kids and sanitize everything and make sure that their hands are clean, they are going to come in contact with other children's germs. It is just the way it is, people. That is just how daycare is. The second thing that happened right before she started daycare was that I got, I went to the doctor for her appointment, her checkup or whatever, and I went ahead and let them give her the flu shot. Now, I am not an anti-vaxxer. I vaccinate my kids. I just generally have never given any of us the flu shot. I, you know, we eat really healthy. We make sure we wash our hands. Uh, you know, we sanitize really well. And I've just never personally felt the need to get the flu shot for our family. Now my husband has to get it because he's in the military and it is a requirement for him. But for the rest of us, um, just based on things that I've read, 
um, in my, I felt like my best opinion and the best choice for me was to not have the rest of us get the flu shot. It wasn't particularly for any reason. It was mostly just because a lot of the things that I had read state that, you know, the, the year, like if I were to get the flu shot today, it would actually be last year's flu that you are being protected from. So it's not necessarily the current year's flu that's going around that you could get protected from. While although they do say that even though that is the case, it can help to decrease symptoms of the flu. With all of that being said, I don't know what exactly happened with her during this time in October, but she developed a cough. And I'm talking <clears throat> like a really bad cough to where she was wheezing and having a difficult time breathing. So first we started by going to the pediatrician. And I'm going to show you right here. I don't know how many of you are familiar with this. But we happened, we were, um, this was actually my son's old one. And it happens to be a panda bear. But this little guy here, okay, this device is called a nebulizer. And there are different types of medications that you put into the, me into the nebulizer. And... Um, the cord hooks up to this type of an apparatus and this little mask and sometimes they come with like a little rubber band to hold it on the baby's face and they breathe into it, okay? And it's basically like a steam and they breathe in the medication. So I'm just going to hold on for one second. We're going to pause it. Okay, I'm back. So... We first went to the doctor. They recommended not putting her on an albuterol treatment. They started her with these little pink vials. I don't know if they're always pink, but it's just kind of like a sodium chloride solution. And it can just kind of help to open up the lungs and help them breathe better. Well, several days passed she wasn't getting any better, she was getting worse. And I can't remember at the time because just a lot of things were happening with her during that time. I'm, we were back and forth to her pediatrician. We were in and out of the emergency room. She wound up with pneumonia. Um, at some other point, they gave us albuterol to give to her. So now she was on albuterol treatments with an occasional sodium chloride in between. And let me just read the box. It says she was supposed to be getting, okay, so she was on this albuterol every four hours, mostly when she was awake. So what I would do is I would get up early in the morning and she would get a treatment before I went to work at around seven. Then around right before her lunchtime, nap time period of the day, I would give her, I would have to have someone come into my classroom and watch my class and I would have to give her another breathing treatment around 11 o'clock. Then she would get a third treatment at three o'clock before I left work at four and she would get her last treatment before she went to bed. Okay, so this was my life. I was attached to this breathing treatment because I had to be there to monitor her, monitor her with getting this medication. You can't just leave a 14, 15 month old alone with a nebulizer treatment and expect them to sit there by themselves. I mean, it's completely irresponsible. So not only was she stuck to the nebulizer treatment, but I was stuck to the nebulizer treatment as well. And if anybody has used these, 
it's not a quick treatment like an inhaler okay you're you're sitting there for like at least I would say over 10 minutes probably more like 15 minutes at a shot um, to make sure that they get all the medication that is in this thing so that's four times a day sitting there 15 minutes and in the beginning she was not crazy about getting these treatments so you're feeling bad because you're struggling with her she's got to get the breathing treatment you know that it's good for her body it's helping her to be able to breathe it's helping to op her open up her lungs she needs the treatment but <sighs> it was an exhausting hot mess as time went on and and it was kind of strange because she would get these treatments and then the doctor would say, well, lay off the albuterol a little bit. So maybe we would go down to like three times a day. And then she kind of seemed like she'd be okay. And then boom, we'd be back in the emergency room because she was literally like gasping for air. So then at that point, I mean, this was just crazy. They added another fun little medication called, I don't even know if you can see it, this. The name on this one is um, Udesonide, but they also call it Pulmacort. So what we would have to do now is um, she would get the albuterol four times a day, followed by the Pulmacort solution twice a day. So what we would do is I would get up extra, extra early in the morning and she would get a, an albuterol treatment and then I would follow that with a Pulmacort treatment. So that was 30 minutes. And then after the Pulmacort, the doctor recommended like patting her back a little bit just to help like break up whatever was in, in, her, in her lungs and in her system. Then the two times she would have her treatments at work, it was just albuterol, and then at night it was back to the albuterol and the pulmacort. And here I am as a mom thinking like, when is this going to end? Like, it was just, I felt like my life was just tied to the nebulizer. And also wondering like, is all this medication, you know, like, what is this doing to my child? So one of the last times that I took her into the pediatrician, I think, I, I don't think, I know, we had a physician's assistant. And now don't get me wrong, I absolutely love my pediatrician's office. Her pediatrician is amazing. Everybody that works there, we love them. Nurses, they're all great. So anyway, we get this different person who had kind of like known her history she had seen her in and out a couple times because we were like practically living there and she finally said listen there is nothing else at this point that we feel professionally that we can do for your daughter we are now going to recommend that we refer you off to a pulmonary specialist and I'm thinking like oh I mean when any kind of doctor tells you that your child needs to see a specialist, it's just completely nerve wracking. I mean, I've got anxiety already. And to think that my daughter, who was perfectly healthy, like the only time she ever went to the pediatrician prior to October was basically for her, her vaccines and her well checks she wasn't a sick child at all before October. And then all of a sudden, all of this happened. So the physician's assistant told me, you know, between the insurance and the pulmonary specialist that it would take some time before I would hear from them and things would be approved and I would be able to get an appointment because I'm sure you all know a lot of times with specialists, they're pushed out like months in advance. So she said, in the meantime, why don't you try? Um, now, I, and I had already mentioned to her, you know, I'm like, I don't know what else to do. Like I'm constantly sanitizing. She doesn't drink dairy, you know? And I think when I said that to her about not drinking dairy, it sparked something in her head. And she said, you know what? 
why not in the meantime take her off of all wheat products and all dairy all together like everything cold turkey just take her off of everything so at first I was a little hesitant because I didn't really know much about the gluten free aspect of you know food shopping or you know how that would how that would work I didn't know what my stores carried so um I, I just wasn't sure about that so but I was willing to try anything I mean anything was worth a shot to just you know get my baby better so that's what we did we started that day on the way home we stopped at the store and I bought like a couple essential things that I knew that she liked I got her some gluten-free pasta and I think it was like some gluten-free cereal bars and just just stuff for the day to get me through I'm like we're gonna start now and then when I went to do a full grocery shop I what I was basically doing because her daycare is on a food program so I would get the menu ahead of time and so if they were serving macaroni and cheese I would just make her her gluten-free dairy-free mac and cheese and bring that in for her like supplement that way there were certain things on the menu that she could still have like fresh fruit totally fine they served uh, Chex Mix for breakfast, which a lot of those are gluten-free anyway. The ones they serve were, so she could have that. So that's kind of what I did. And the craziest thing happened. Within about a week, I noticed that she was needing the albuterol treatments less and less and less. And this was probably getting close to February because in early February, like the the second week in February, about that time frame, me and my sister took the kids to Disney. And what we realized was that she was breathing fine. And she, she was down to one breathing treatment a day. And we stayed at Disney for a week. And by the time we got home, she was not on breathing treatments anymore and it is now today is March 31st and she has not had a breathing treatment since we left Disney which was I think we came home February 16th she has not had a breathing treatment at all her breathing is fantastic um, there's no wheezing there's obviously no coughing. I've spoken to the pediatrician about it because they had wanted to see her when we came back from our trip. And, you know, I explained to them everything. And I talked to, at that point, I the specialist had called me and they were like, well, we're ready to make this appointment. And I said, well, why don't we just kind of hold off? It doesn't seem like she's needing it. This diet that she's on, this like food lifestyle seems to be helping so that's where we are so that is why Arlington is not um sorry that is why Arlington is on a gluten-free dairy-free diet I'm not sure if it is the gluten that was causing her to have these issues or the dairy or both mixed together I'm not really 100% sure but whatever the case is, there was something about those two particular foods that clearly were affecting her body. And so we are just going to stick with this gluten and dairy free regime for now. And I'll show you a few of our favorite things that um, we like to, excuse me, that we like to feed her and uh, that she likes to eat. She has no problem with any of it. She can still, like I said, she can still eat, you know, any fruits and vegetables, which she absolutely loves. Um, so, yeah. So, let me show you some of the things that we get at the store. And it's not as crazy expensive as I think I initially 
thought that it would be. And I think that was one of my first concerns was like, just because I didn't know, I was like, oh my gosh, like, this is going to be crazy expensive. But it's really not bad. I mean, she's little. She doesn't eat that much for her age. And let me just show you some of the things that we get for her, and then I'll explain all of that. Okay, so I'm just going to show you a couple of the things that I can get at uh, Walmart is usually where I shop, but I can also get most of this stuff at the commissary. She really likes these gluten-free raspberry fig bars. She will sometimes have those for breakfast along with a, and she absolutely loves these, these so delicious dairy-free coconut milk yogurts. They come in a couple of flavors that she really likes. She really enjoys the vanilla, strawberry banana, and raspberry flavors. We buy her gluten-free pasta, and this lasts for usually, I mean, over a week, depending on how much pasta she's eating during the week. For her breads, or, well, we usually buy her like sliced gluten-free bread. These are um, ciabatta bread. She really, really likes these. So if we're having like spaghetti, I'll make her her gluten-free spaghetti, and then she'll like to have one of these ciabatta um, biscuits on the side. She really definitely likes those. For snacks, snacks can get a little tricky because snacks at a lot of the local grocery stores, as far as being gluten-free, are either things that are a little too like grown up for her, like a lot of like chocolate and more like, I don't know, I hate to say junk food, but just different things that she probably wouldn't eat. So that part gets a little more tricky. The things that you can find uh, that are pretty common, you can find um, gluten-free graham crackers, gluten-free saltines, but those get a little boring. Um, we had found, a, we don't live near a Whole Foods, which I wish we did, but um, she absolutely loved these, and if I had known that, I would have like stocked up on them. They're by Lesser Evil, and they are, they're called Paleo Puffs, and they're no cheese cheesiness, so they're gluten-free and dairy-free, and she, loves these and I think there's like there's probably like five left in the package so I'm gonna have to order her more of those online she also likes veggie sticks which you can pretty much find in any grocery store um, for milk she drinks oat milk we when we can find the silk oat milk, we will get her the silk oat milk, but then she also, I can't remember the brand. There's another brand, I think it's Oatly or something like that. She, she'll drink that brand too, but we kind of like stick to the oat milks. We tried other milk for her, like we had tried rice milk, we tried coconut milk, we tried almond milk, and she just just wasn't a fan. So there's not a real reason other than taste as to why we go with the oat milk. It's just her preference is that she likes it the best and that's what she'll drink. Um, also, I should mention because she is drinking oat milk, it does not have the same fat content as some dairy milks. So what we will do sometimes is sprinkle a little bit of flax meal in with her yogurt. Um, she also eats avocados. She likes, like if we mash it up, she'll like, like kind of like a guacamole type of thing. That way she's getting like the healthy fats that are super good and super important for a baby's brain and their brain development. So that's what we do for that. And I think later on, she's napping right now, but maybe when she wakes up, I was thinking about making some kind of, um, cause obviously we're staying home, can't go anywhere anyway. Um, maybe making some gluten-free muffins and sharing a recipe with you on those. We had picked up, and I'm not sure if I say this right, I think it's called Udi's and I'm sorry, 
for your brand if you're watching my video, which you're probably not, but I think that that's how you say the name. We had bought a pack, a four pack of frozen blueberry booties muffins that she absolutely loved, but she has finished them since then. So I was thinking about maybe making her some kind of like fruit type muffins. And we, like I said, we'll share that recipe with you. Also, um, a couple other things that are common in a grocery store that you can get are like gluten-free waffles are pretty common. You can get those in a couple different varieties. Um, let me think. Oh, for protein, she can eat. I mean, she can eat meat. So um, if it's something more kid-friendly like chicken nuggets, they do make a gluten-free chicken nugget so that the breading doesn't have any wheat or dairy in it. But other than that, she can have, um, yeah, she can have meat. So she's getting her protein. She loves peanut butter and jelly. So peanut butter is okay. She is getting plenty, plenty of protein and um, all of her other nutrients from other sources. And so anyway, to sum things up, that is why my toddler is on a gluten and dairy-free diet. It's not some trendy thing that I just decided to do or, you know, was like, oh, you know, let's be different. Let's try this. No, like she's on it because of health reasons and it's working. So that is why we are doing this. So in a little while when she wakes up, like I said, we'll be, I guess, making some muffins. <laughs>